it's time to visit the land of the midnight sun for a taste of some Nordic terroir. In this episode, we sit down with Stefan Hansen from Norway's Hamburgeria. This brewery with the intimidating name was founded in 2005 by four homebrewers. Since then, they produced a myriad of great beers ranging from the ultra-modern to ales inspired by a distant, smoky past. Welcome to No Pants During the Pandemic. I'm Kevin Brooks, and this is No Pants During the Pandemic. Today I'm speaking with Stefan Hansen from Hamburgeri in Drammen, Norway. Hey Stefan, how you doing, man? Hey man, nice nice to meet you again. <laughs> yes, we've met before. So and that uh, was back I... in uh, Denver the first time, right? At the uh, Shelton Fest? Was that the first time you came over for Shelton? or would... I can't remember when they all those festivals blended together. Yeah, I think that was the first time I specifically went to the festival. I was so jet lagged uh, the first day. I, I I couldn't talk to people. I was just uh huh. Mm-hmm. And and the altitude probably gave you a nice kick in the butt too, because it's well significantly higher than Norway. Yeah, uh, but you know, great place, great city, great people, and a lot of, a lot of great beers. Oh yeah. Why don't we just jump right into things and? Uh, why don't you tell me who you are and a little bit about yourself? My name is Stefan Hansen. I'm uh, the sales manager uh, or sales damager for uh, Honbrugeria in uh, Drammen, Norway. Brewery started up in 2005 for uh, home brewers brewing at a very, very small scale. When people see the name of the brewery on the side of a can or a bottle, you know, at least for English speakers, it's a little imposing. So could you properly pronounce the name of your brewery you know uh, uh, the guys at the brewery will probably say that i say it wrong because i have a west coast accent uh so i say it differently than they do uh, i say Hundringria. and they do a sort of more uh, eastern norway sing-song uh, version of uh, Hundringria. uh it sounds it sounds pretty much the same, uh, and, it, and it just means hand brewery. So, Stefan, tell me how you got into beer. I, you know, I actually one one of my very first beer uh, experiences was drinking a beer called uh, Bavarian Weizen. That was the first Hefeweizen beer, and to this day, I still remember that the first time I smelled that beer. That was just like shocked, and like beer can taste like this. Yeah, that was. Back in 2006, I think. A few years later, the very first sour beer I tried was a beer called uh, European Sour Blend, which Hunt had done with uh, Die Molen and Love Beer. That was the first beer I actually queued for, like all the cool kids do do these days. Seems like you were meant to work for Hunt. Yeah, I sort of um, the way I got into uh, to brewery uh, to make a short story quite long and not so interesting i was actually playing in the blues trio with a guy called gar who is the head of the brewer of a craft brewery in uh, bergen i sort of just mentioned i can't find han beers in bergen now this was back in 2014 i think and the guy's just like, oh, well, why don't you do something about it? So I basically just called brewery and said, I can't find your beers. What's going on? And they basically said the same thing. Uh, why don't you just give give it a go? Um, and they've been stuck with me since. <laughs> so the brewery's located um, in Drammen, 
Um, what what's what's that city like? It's like you know seventy thousand people living there. They have a really great lager brewery called Us. It's an old family owned uh, brewery. It's really a lager and Pilsner city. But uh, Drummond has been good to us. There's a really growing craft beer scene uh, in Drummond now. Small, nice city with nice people. Is Norway, at least their Nor, uh, or I should say, was Norway basically more or less an industrial lager drinking country? Oh, yeah. Until Nögne and Hand started doing their thing, it, it was all just lagers. It's still mostly lagers, just like in the US. I would say the last 10 years, people in general seem to have noticed hoppy beers. And that's what we mostly make. Now, you guys, are you in your third location now? Is this the fourth location? Oh, my location? God. I think we're in our fourth or fifth. I, I remember at one point you were in like a sock factory or something, an old sock. You know, it was a random clothing type manufacturer was what the building used to be. Um, yeah, that, that was that was the second uh, location. And then it was uh, the old train station and then it was Brockerea and now we're down in uh, the harbor side uh, and hopefully we, we won't have to move again. Historically pre I guess lagers I mean there's been brewing in Norway for well probably a thousand years. Vikings uh, went to Scotland and discovered brewing there and brought it back to Norway so that would have been around 800-900 first law in Norway, the Gulatings law, stated that you had to brew beer and it had to taste good. It had to be your wife's weight in malt or something like that. You know, beer has always been a staple of people's food. And when Han started, uh, Jens Mødal, who was then the head brewer, he had read an old book about recipes from uh, farms. So he decided to make sort of farm uh, inspired beers. The house culture back then was uh, they used a the bread culture and the old farm beers were kind of smoky because you know with kilning of the malt you had to use uh, an open fire. So that was sort of in the hand DNA from day, uh, day uh, one. One of the first beer events I did when I went to Shelton Brothers was actually a hand one. You made the Hezjol at that point. I loved bringing it out and being like, this is akin to a Saison. This is just Norway's take on it. It is a farmhouse ale. This is what the farmers would have made, more or less. And that's a um, staple of brewery, um, this Nordic terroir thing. And not taking uh, anything away from the other breweries, but to me, Hand was the most original and inspiring brewery of the first class of craft breweries from Norway. The way I always thought about uh, Hand, as opposed to, you know, like Lervig and, uh, and Nudnia, they were both kind of looking to the United States and maybe even Denmark at that point, who were a little ahead of you guys, where you guys turned around and looked back into Norway. I admired that. It was, just, you know, it gave you something that was different than so many other people. If you look at it, it's, it's, it's a kind of Nordic-Belgian hybrid mix with uh, the Flemish-inspired beers uh, like Honbach. You guys started with the sour beers pretty early. It might have even been like in the first year. You know, we're looking at 2005, 2006. You guys were ridiculously far ahead of the curve, at least with craft brewers as opposed to traditional brewers making yeah. you know, s sour beers. I think Hornbach, uh, the first batch, was released in 2006. And then earlier you also mentioned that, you know, most of the beers you make are hoppy, which to me, you know, it's it's not what Hond is, but that's because I didn't get the hoppy beers here in the United States. We got the ones that could travel better, so the sour and the smoky and the bigger ones. But I mean, that is, well, it's what people want. You got to do that. Plus, well, they do sell really well. I have to, I have to tell you, man, like hoppy beers that... That's what pays the bills. At uh, the end of the day, you could love it or hate it, but those are the facts. And that's probably been one of the avenues we have worked the most with the last few years, just perfecting our processes. Stephen has brought a lot of 
energy and detail and knowledge to our hoppy beers. Starting with the hoppy ones, why don't you walk me through your beers? Yeah, so um, our best selling beers are uh, two 4.5 beers called Humlesus and Lillelodog. Humla just means hops. It's basically a very easy drinking citra pale ale. The thing I really like about this beer is that it's so clean in the sense that, you know, it so elegantly brewed, I would have to say. There's mostly just uh, Pilsner malt and citra hops. And then you have Lille Lodag. It's a sort of uh, midweek Saturday. Historically, Wednesdays were the day that the maids and the butlers would have their day off because they would have to work weekends when uh, the rich had their uh, parties. So they would get Wednesday off and go out and drink. So our little old dog is a hazy pale ale with a ton of citra and mosaic, which all the cool kids do. Super tasty, super drink- drinkable. We're sort of seeing a small renaissance of West Coast beers. So we have a 6.5 called Field Flamme, which I would say is a more East Coast inspired West Coast beer. A little bit more malty, uh, Munich caramel malts like uh, uh, Dogfish had 60 minutes. And then we have Bon Gus, which is our new classic West Coast double IPA. Until we made it beer, I hadn't realized how much I actually missed that old school Deepa, really. It has lots of Cascade hops, which I sort of think is a forgotten hop. It's not like Citra and Mosaic and uh, Laurel and all of those more fancy hops. We also have four different hazy New England beers. The ones we do are a little bit more Vermont style and you know, there's no lactose. They're not more of the New York style like uh, uh, other half. We finally have a Hefeweizen again, um, which I'm really happy about. Is that because that was one of the first craft or, uh, you know, different styles that you fell in love with? Yeah, that was uh, a pretty selfish project I had. Like, I really wanted to have a Hefeweizen. But on uh, the other hand, from a sales manager's perspective, none of the craft breweries in Norway were really doing a good Hefeweizen or doing a Hefeweizen at all. We have the wine monopoly in Norway, and Norway import a lot of German beers. So I pitched the uh, idea of uh, canned Hefeweizen to them, and they uh, loved the idea. So that will be released in... 340 wine uh, wine monopoly stores uh, next in the next month. Cool. I want to come back to the wine monopoly, but before then, can you talk about some of your old school beers? Uh, so we have uh, Nor- Norwegian Wood, which is our most pronounced smoke beer so far. I won't say that it's like classic Rausch beer, as with everything we do, there's a there's a little twist to it. And yeah, you have uh, Dark Force, which is a uh, lightly smoked, rustic imperial wheat stout. The Odin Stipple will definitely go into a can later. And of course, we have a lot, a lot of sour beers now, like Hornbach. It's a whole series now with Hornbach and a Dashing Rogue, which is, which is basically Hornbach with raspberries and cherries and figaro which is hornbach with figs and strawberries we just recently bought four new tanks which will go into our sour facility and we'll start doing a new range of sour beers we sort of want to make our sour beers a little bit more nuanced a little bit more fruity maybe a little bit more uh, accessible but still have that hand signature and we have a new fantastic uh smoked beer called of wooden smoke which is a eight percent akavit barrel aged smoked lager if you're into uh smoked beers it tastes just amazing i'm intrigued by that i love smoked lagers but generally you see bigger beers being aged in aquavit barrels 
We have a Rolex system from Germany, and those babies are made for lagers. And in our tap room, that's what we sell the most of, because like I mentioned, the people in Drummond love lagers. It's good to give people a chance to drink beers. Craft beer is all about creativity and giving people something new. And that's why, um, you know, when people put down breweries that do, you know, hazy beers or pastry stouts or those crazy kettle sours, I'm sort of going the other way saying, okay, maybe it's not, not so much for us, but I'm not going to put down new breweries for making new types of beers yeah that's what we did you know giving people options drinking trends change i don't subscribe to the notion that because a beer is of a certain style that it's a crappy beer but at the end of the day you know there's people doing great versions of every style and there's a lot of people doing bad versions you're actually one of the few people who's actually gotten that out well it's not that the style's bad it's just that a lot of the ones out there are really bad yeah and the i mean but then the annoying thing of course is that you know for so many people that's like the only style and you're like oh for the love of god dude try this beer my uh, education is uh historian that's, uh, I have a master's uh, degree back from OBG system, must have been from 2012. And I sort of looked at what's the biggest difference with beer of today and craft beers that we got into back in the early 2000s. And then it's the old school craft beer that came about at, in the same time as the slow food movement really kicked off. But today's beers, they have a sort of immediate gratification sort of thing if you know what i mean yep your beer has to impress from the first sip it doesn't have time to like slowly evolve in your glass and i think that's probably a bit of the time we live in with uh, instagram it has to look spectacular and that's the kind of market that today's new breweries has you know that's what they have to work with that shortened time span uh, or um, uh, attention span. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love when I find when a brewery, a new brewery pops up and it isn't, they aren't catering to that. Um, it, and they just somehow are, you know, able to, I don't know, succeed while doing things a completely different way. Um, it, you know, like, a, well, actually, you mentioned Denver before, like Bierstadt in Denver. You know, that totally is the antithesis of what you would expect a newer brewery to be. Yeah. I think it's really funny, uh, the sort of, a lot of brewers' fixation on lagers, because we spend so much time just getting away from lagers, or bad lagers, and sort of going full circle. But to me, I'm a little apprehensive. I don't want people in general to go back to lagers. If they do, they don't really need craft breweries. <laughs> well, why don't we kind of, I guess, steer back in a little bit here. How big is Han Bregaria at this point? Employment-wise, we're 15 people these days. Size-wise, uh, liquid-wise, how big is Han? Uh, 2020 was almost a little ashamed to say it, but for us, that is the year uh, we sold the most beer. So we sold around 600,000 liters in 2020, and I'm hopefully looking at 30 to 40 percent growth uh, this this year. Cool. I, I'm hearing that for not every brewer, but for a lot of brewers, you know, they were able to make 2020 successful years. People were uh, basically just sitting at home, and and then it really comes down to I think I think people were drinking the classics. Uh, again, you know the, the 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 brands they knew, the well-known beers. Yeah, uh, and a, you know, and people wanted to go back, and they know that you know, sixty-minute IPA or a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, if it's sitting on the shelf a little bit, it's okay. You know, it's not going bad. Uh, you know, in two weeks. And you know that beer is well made. Exactly. So COVID comes to Europe. You know how how does Norway respond 
And then how does Han Bergeriet respond, you know, to the pandemic? In the beginning, we were all just going, what? And fuck. Uh, pardon my French. I was doing a tap takeover at a bar in Bergen called uh, Apollon, which is a fantastic combined bar and uh, record store. We tasted one beer, and then a bartender told us, uh, we have to close because there's a nationwide emergency or every bar has to close and uh, everybody has to go home, basically. The day after, everyone was uh, informed that we all had to take some time off they kept on the brewers because we still had to make beer, but we didn't know anything. I think I had one month off before it was back to work. From there, our sales with Home Zeus and Ilodog and the shop strength beer it was just absolutely crazy. And things opened up, up again for the summer. We had a pretty good summer as well. And then the second wave hit, and it's been going a little slower after that. But uh, we're still selling a pretty good amount of beer. How about the people who worked in the tap room and the tasting room? Were you able to find stuff for them to do, or what did, did you have to furlough them? How did that work out for them? Our CEO has been very good at you know just trying to keep everyone uh, at work the whole time. We have a pretty chill and laid back culture at brewery. Just work hard and things will work itself out. That's probably our motto. Uh, most of the bars on the eastern part of Norway, it's, uh, it's closed right now. But uh, on uh, the west coast, it's uh, open again. And I'm, I'm doing my first beer tasting for months tomorrow, actually. We're going to launch four new beers, and that's going to be great. It feels like a little bit of normalcy again. But still, you know, the bar business is... With the way things are going, and and if they don't get to open up again soon, you know, there's there's going to be a bloodbath basically. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see what sort of meets us come summer uh, to see how many bars are still left. Uh, I fear for a lot of our friends in the business. Same here. During your time at home, and then just in the slightly quieter times of the pandemic. Uh, you know, have you found any positives that you've been able to glean out of this? We definitely be spending uh, more time with my kids. Uh, uh, the kindergarten is straight next to our house, so I do the. You know, I, I get uh, uh, my daughter to kindergarten each morning, and I pick her up and I go back to work. That's great. Anything else? I don't have to travel a lot, and so that has sort of given me time to play drums again and actually practicing, which I haven't done for probably 10 or 15 years because it's mostly when I have been playing, it's been, you know, it's just been gigs, and you could get to a certain point and then just get uh, get lazy, I guess. I, you know, I guess before I forget, and I could easily forget, um, you know, as a brewer, you guys have had you know, a bunch of, I guess, hurdles that, you know, being Norwegian, um, have you, you've had thrown at you. Now you've got the, the wine store, or the wine monopoly, and then, you know, what, what is, can you explain what that is? So, um, the wine monopoly is exactly that. In uh, Norway, every beer that's stronger than 4.5% alcohol has to be sold in the, to wine monopoly. If you want volume and you're not the newest hype brewery, then you basically need to get a listing. And the nice thing about the wine monopoly is that they do their tastings blind. So they don't look at the hype, they look at beer styles and how well uh, breweries make those styles. They have recruited very knowledgeable people about, you know, that have worked in the beer industry the last few uh, few years and that has been very positive for the breweries in Norway. It can be very strict and it can be very time consuming. If I want a beer in basic I have to pitch the idea. A few months later it can be on the, their tender sheet where they will say that next year I will uh, start selling these beers but you have to apply to this tender. You have 
two months to make a beer and we'll try try the beer and you you may or may not win a tender uh, so the, there's a year-long horizon on most beers that go to the uh, Y Monopoly you can't just say that oh you know next week we'll make a uh, insert your favorite hop combo uh, and we'll just launch the beer you, you have to wait it's not like if you have your own tap room you can you can oh, oh okay guys let's make a Citra Mosaic Laurel double IPA and we'll launch it in five uh, five weeks when we get labels. It's the same with the with the chain stores. There's two times each year where you can uh, launch new uh, new beers. One of the things that I think has helped push craft beer forward globally is marketing and the internet, social media. But before that, just regular websites. In Norway, there used to be a rule that you know, kind of present, prevented you from marketing the way most breweries in other countries were. Yeah, we don't have a marketing uh, department. Uh, we do sales, uh, but we really don't do anything uh, in official chat uh, in official chan channels because we can't. If I want to do something on Facebook, I, it has to be in a group where every member uh, has applied to be a member of the group because there's a rule that you can't advertise, but people can seek out information about beers. So there's just a uh, hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, basically. We have sort of slowly started to build Instagram up but it has to be in uh, English because it needs to be directed at the export market. We had some meetings with the health uh, officials and the government and said, like, the way things are going with the rules now, you're basically killing us off. And this is a violation of the European Union rules about, you know, uh, having sort of equal rights. Good luck getting the rules changed. Now, one thing I forgot to bring up is that you guys recently opened a tap room. Uh, we launched a tap room uh, last year. It's by the seaside in Robin. It's a fantastic place to, to have your beers. We have uh, two uh, Czech style tap handles. So you, you always get fresh and perfectly poured lagers at Hunt. We're very proud of that. We do take our lagers seriously how many beers do you pour at the tap room oh uh we have 14 tap lines right now most of the time we'll have one or two guest beers just to show people something else you're not gonna lack for a quality beer when you come through brewery what's the place itself like you know it's uh easy going and uh, what's fun about it is the locals are going there of course there's a lot of fanboys and beer geeks and that's a sort of different clientele the locals will mostly you know get a pint while the beer nerds will get a flight i've gotten to the point where i want a pint i'll have a blonde or a pilsner or a pale ale and i'm good i just want a glass i want the full glass i want what the brewer intended the serving size to be that's yeah. that's to me the full experience of it yeah, to me, like if uh, a a great beer, you, you know, you should be able to have a full glass of a half bison or a pale ale. Of course, if it's a really big stout, I really don't mind that it's just a small pour. A full pour of an imperial stout, you know, is maybe a tulip glass or something. You know, it's a smaller glass, yeah. but it's still, it's still, you know, you're not drinking four ounces of it or five five ounces of it and shit ticking it off on your untapped profile yeah, yeah. You, you want the, the full the full thing my last question is you know what's next for hond that's a very good question i, I think you know uh Brigia, it's a sort of legacy brewery and i and i think a lot of breweries can relate to how we have to meet 
the modern beer consumer or the haze boy or if if you will the the untapped generation and I, and, and I think basically there's still room for great beer in the sense that you have to stick true to what you believe in, are great beers but you also have to stay true to what got you into craft beer in, in the first place and that is options it's quality control and if you decide to do a beer do it because you want to find out what makes that beer style tick and how can you make a good quality interesting version of that that is the way for sort of more le uh, legacy breweries like, uh, like us to stay relevant if you want to make a great West Coast uh, double IPA, make that beer. If you want to make a half of ice, make that beer. And if you want to make a smoothie beer, make a smoothie beer, but make it in a way that you feel that it should taste and smell and make a beer that you're proud of and, and don't do it in a way that you don't like, but you think the kids will like. A little sage wisdom direct from Norway. Stefan, thanks for hanging out with me tonight, talking about Hond, and hopefully we get to hang out sometime in the near future. Yeah, man, I really hope so. Uh, I haven't been to, I haven't been to the U.S. now for wow, uh, eighteen months. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. It was nice to uh, to be on your show. It was nice to chat to chat again. And I really hope we can uh, that we can hook up again soon and uh, and get some beers. I hope so too. I'll talk with you soon, man. Bye bye. If you'd like to learn more about Hamburgeri, you can check out their website. The link's in the video's description. And if you like this or any of the other episodes of No Pants, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.